Before we start, uh, only another 30 seconds about uh, Chesapeake and uh, its activity. Chesapeake has been, uh, has been uh, focusing on different pillars of peace for years now. It's now four years we are working here in Tirana. And uh, even if now we are online, but basically in Tirana, what we do is that uh, first we organize uh, every year a summer school in peace science at the beginning of September. And uh, then we organize a series of meetings like, like this one. And recently we have released uh, a report which is called Urbania in the Eyes of the World, which I invite you to, uh, to have a look on, on, the, on our website. Uh, which is nothing, which is a collection of uh, measures of indicators on Albania and the Western, other Western Balkan countries um, in a comparative fashion uh, with some uh, deepenings too. And um, it is uh, comprehensive for many aspects of, uh, of, um, of social life and international relations. So, uh, why we are here tonight? We are here tonight because we are uh, going to deal with a very relevant uh, point in, uh, cur in uh, current uh, um, in current uh, international uh, relation, international diplomacy. Basically, the role of women, the role of women in uh, in diplomacy, and with a special focus on. Uh, on Southeast uh, uh, Europe. Our special guests tonight are uh, first uh, Lia Quartapelle from uh, Lawmaker from Italy. Welcome, Lia. Uh, thanks for being for being here. Uh, who is uh, who is uh, um, in the in the network of uh, um, in the advisory board of the, the network Women in International Security. Okay, and then Brinda Pascali. Brinda Pascali, Albanians know her very well because she's an advisor of the president of Albania uh, and she has been uh, uh, deputy minister of uh, economic development, tourism, uh, trade, and uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, so, two women we, we, who, are, uh, who are in uh, in, uh, in politics, uh, who are international relations too. So the, we couldn't find better uh, better guests for our for our being in July. Why why this meeting? Uh, not only because women the, the, the role of women is uh, um, in our personal perspective, but rather because perhaps uh, many of you don't know that two, 20 years ago. In particular, uh, in October 20, uh, 2000, uh, the United Nations has released a resolution on this. Uh, in particular, the agenda uh, titled Women, Peace and Security has been launched with resolution 1325 by Security Council of the United Nations. Uh, the, 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 the focal point of this resolution, UN resolution, was uh, to some extent revolutionary because uh, the perspective uh, about women uh, was totally uh, uh, was totally changed. A uh, few years ago, few years ago, and uh, in the in the eyes of many people, the role of women in a conflict was basically a role of uh, victims. Women were interpreted as victims in uh, in uh, in uh, armed conflicts uh, worldwide, but they had no specific role in uh, uh, peace building, in peacekeeping first, and eventually in peace building. Uh, with uh, um, up in the, after this resolution, now the perspective totally totally changed. Uh, now we are here because we are going to discuss exactly this. So. I would start by inviting uh, Honorevole Lia Quartapelle, Honorable Lia Quartapelle from, uh, so from the Italian Parliament to describe, uh, to describe, uh, uh, to expound uh, her experience in the woman, in the women of international security network and also in the, the, Italian, uh, the Italian commitment 
to this, in particular in the, in the network of uh, women peacekeepers in the Mediterranean Basin. Uh, I, I forgot the exact title, but uh, we understood. Okay, so Leah, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Raul. Um, I'm very happy to be invited by Chespic uh, for this meeting, for this lesson. And I'd love to be in Albania with you, uh, but it's not possible. But uh, uh, it would be great if we could do that uh, maybe another time. Well, um, Raul invited me to, to talk to you about the experience that Italy is doing uh, with um, uh, what comes, uh, the experience that Italy is doing with um, uh, implementing what is contained in Resolution 1325. Uh, 20, 20, 20 years ago, it will be 21 years ago in September, uh, the United Nations General Assembly approved Resolution 1325 on the role of women in uh, conflicts and in peace. It was an important resolution, um, not for the proposals it put forward, but especially for the angle it gives to the analysis of international relations and especially conflicts. Uh, the idea that uh, there is a gendered perspective on the conflicts and on mediation efforts was something that was completely um, excluded by international relations practice and theory. But actually, there is a gender perspective, as in every, everything else. I'm not, um, uh, well, I, I am a feminist, but I, I'm not uh, like a hardline feminist. But I think that uh, in, in foreign affairs, uh, adopting um, what is an angle that includes the specific perspective of women in conflict um, allows us to have a broader view of the problems on the ground and especially of the solutions. Um, why? Um, I'm very happy to speak about it in a Balkan country. Uh, you know uh, much better than I do to what extent women can be used in conflicts, to what this extent rape can be used as a weapon in a conflict. Uh, the war in the former Yugoslavia was probably, um, uh, at least for myself, but I think for, for many other people, was the, the clear demonstration of how you can use women um, in dividing up what countries are uh, in, and in drawing lines between people, culture, ethnicities, and how you can use violence against women as a powerful and symbolic tool to say something about uh, your idea of the world. So, this was one of the first uh, points contained in Resolution 1325. The fact that there is a specific violence that can be inflicted on women, and this specific violence can have consequences for how the, the war is fought, and also how peace can be built. Uh, so there are lots of uh, problems connected to uh, mending um, the effects of the use of violence against women in a war. And this, of course, is, is becoming much more important in the past, uh, after the Second World War, and after uh, when wars are mainly wars fought against civilians rather than war uh, fought um, in the battlefield. So that's the first point of Resolution 1325. Second point is to what extent women can be um, considered as part of a solution to a conflict. In any, any nation in the world, uh, women are more than half of, half of the population, but only 3% of international mediators in conflicts are women. 
despite the fact that uh, the fact that um, uh, mediation efforts have been led by men has not always brought to good results. I mean, lots of mediation efforts have failed. So you would probably think, mm, maybe it's better to change mediators. The fact that, um, so th there is this, this issue that in, to include in mediation teams, uh, women um, might help finding solutions. Also because women generally are not uh, armed parties. They generally bring in mediation teams ideas and perspectives more of the civilian population rather than of the armed gangs. So the civilian population is the one that has more interests in the conflict to end. And the fact that women are part of the mediation teams might bring this perspective much more than including only men. And generally men in mediation teams are uh, men that belong to some of the parties in the conflict. So they, 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 they are ambiguous at best in their commitment to finding a peaceful solution. That's why the resolution 1325 is important because it changes the angle. It changes the angle on how a war is fought and how a peace is built. After this resolution 1325, lot of initiatives have sprung up. Italy, uh, since uh, 2017, has decided to put money in an action plan for the resolution of conflict, uh, in an action plan for implementing resolution 1325, which means that every year we give 1 million euros to different actions uh, that are geared at including women and including a gender perspective in, 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 in mediation and in how we tackle conflicts. This means, for example, training our uh, uh, female officers in the armed forces that take part in, uh, in peace building. Italy has a huge contingent, is the biggest uh, Western um, mm, uh, supplier of troops to the to the UN uh, led efforts in peace building and peacekeeping throughout the world and we have female female uh, officials in those contingents a part of the national action plan for implementing resolution 3025 uh, considers actually training these officials uh, and then another part big part of our effort concerns building network of women mediators for the Mediterranean. We all live in the Mediterranean. We know how complicated, but how fascinating it is to live in this area, which is a really a model of different culture, different civilization, different religion, different ethnicities, and how these differences have produced uh, incredible pieces of culture and uh, uh, understanding, but also how this cradle has produced a lot of conflicts. And we know that the Mediterranean is uh, full of conflicts. Italy is presently training a couple of media women mediators in each nation of the Mediterranean, including, of course, Albania, but not only. Um, and uh, this is an effort to bring this idea of uh, building peace together including women in an area that is, of course, uh, strategic for the interests of our country, but is also crucial for the future of humanity. So this is a way of how to use Resolution 1325 um, for having a different look on uh, international relations and peace and conflict theories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. I think that you are trying the basic points of uh, that. Uh, I mean, they appear to be quite simple to respond it, but they are crucial. I mean, and uh, in particular, when you spoke about the composition of uh, diversity of mediation team and the role of women they, they may play within these teams, that uh, is extremely um, interesting for us. Now we, uh, we can. Uh, we can switch to, uh, we can uh, move forward and uh, we welcome uh, Brunilda Pascali. Uh, 
thanks uh, for being here. Brunita Pascali, as I told you, as I told you, she's the special advisor of, of President uh, Meta here in Albania, and um, she has been also the, uh, in the past. She has been a deputy minister of economic development, and uh, she's a special advisor of, pre of the president to the president on uh, the social and gender issues. So, what I'm asking you, uh, what I'm asking now is, uh, what, what, if you can start by giving a sketch on the role of women in politics here in Albania, but even in the broader area of Balkans. Thanks. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Caruso. It's a pleasure to be finally inside the room. Hello, uh, Mrs. Quartapele. It's nice to meet you online. Uh, well, you know, technology is very helpful, but sometimes it's even hard. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And to tell the truth, uh, when uh, when you invited me to take part in this um, in this uh, conference or uh, online uh, meeting, the role of women in politics and diplomacy in Southeast Europe, I was really happy to to be part of that. As as you said, as you mentioned, I've been working a lot on the last fifteen years uh, for the economic and uh, political empowerment of of women. And uh, so trying to give my contribution as best as, as I could. Uh, well, as, as everybody knows, as we all know, empowering women remains a challenge. It's but not only for Albania, uh, but it remains a challenge for all the Eastern Europe, uh, Balkan area, and even, even in, on a broader sense. Uh, when we speak of inequalities or uh, problems, we, speak, we, we usually speak of the right for education, which is the inequalities between boys and girls, or uh, sometimes we speak about the, 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 the wage gap between men and women, which uh, late in 2020 was 16%, so women get paid 16% less, uh, less than men. Or, uh, but uh, sometimes then we talk about them, which is very important, the political uh, gap or difference between men and women. So the involvement of girls and, and women in politics. Uh, well, we as a country, Albania, has made great steps uh, in the last 15, 20 years. More or less 15 years have been more uh, important. And uh, so women in Albania re really uh, won the right to vote 101 years ago, to, in 1920, uh, together with the, with the USA. So at the same year, we had the right to vote. But the, the political participation has been really um, not, not very so broad. So it has been, it, in, and it's still limited. And uh, I know that you, you uh, have seen the, the World Economic Forum, which measures the gender equality, and Albania is performing well. Uh, because, for example, women in Albanian parliament make up, percent, uh, make up 29% of our parliament uh, as of the election 2017. And this is the highest percentage ever in Albania. And, uh, but we have had some, uh, well, some milestones, which were, for example, in 2008, uh, we uh, changed the electoral uh, code and made it possible the quota, uh, the, the percentage of the quotas for women, which was which is 30 percent. And this is still the case in Albania. So we are we have this uh, this rule of putting of the parties, political parties having to put on the list 30 percent. However, there is there is a problem there because it says that uh, one in the uh, one in the three, first three position should be a woman okay so if so there are only the first three positions then afterwards in the list uh, there is no no obligation so the women can be then bef before after these three the first three in the list they can be everywhere in the list and sometimes the parties tend to put the women at the end of the list which makes it hard for the women candidates to uh, to go to the parliament because uh, so the party does not win the, all the, the the members of the list all of the candidates on the list so uh, they they suffer because of this uh, so this is one of the things that uh, the women organization have been trying to change so just like as it is in the first three places it should be for every three places one should be a woman so the thirty percent. And that's why then when we come out at the end, uh, out of the election, 
the percentage is lower than 30% because of, of this problem. While we have done a very good job uh, with the uh, women in the municipality, municipality councils, that was really something that I wish and I hope it will be done even for the, for the political elections. It was uh, like in, in, in the year 2015, before the local elections, it was decided that men and women would be the same. So 50%, the list of the, of the candidates for the uh, municipality councils would be 50-50. And that thing brought really a great participation of women, even though, again, the, the outcome was less. But anyway, it was, uh, again, it was much higher than before. So we had like in 2017, we had uh, 37%, 2015, 37% of the councillors were women. And in uh, later on in 2019, 44%. But uh, what I consider very important uh, is how much is the, the women's voice heard? Because of course, you can be part of, uh, of uh, policy making of parliament, of the city council. Uh, well, we know that uh, the, the equality issues, the, the principles of gender sensitive parliaments, or even the real equality of men and women in local life can be, uh, can be let's say, advanced and achieved only if men and women are in, in equal positions. So, uh, and men and women should be in those positions where they can influence policies where they can change, uh, let's say, uh, laws in the parliament, where they can improve uh, gender, uh, improve laws and on gender equality, or when they can serve as role models. For me as a woman, it's very important that uh, women uh, have a role model with other, so of the other women. Because uh, unfortunately in Albania, but in all our region, a, lot, a great uh, a percentage of women uh, does not, is not interested on politics. So, uh, for example, in Albania, it's, according to a study it's, uh, of UN women, it's like 57, 55, 57 percent of the women are not so uh, lack interest in politics. So who better than a woman uh, can make an other women interested in politics? So uh, that would be the best example uh, to involve women in political life. So you put a woman somewhere and she would serve as a role model and, and a best example. Because let's say it frankly, so what democracy is it if 50% uh, of the population is not involved or only part of the 50% of the population is, invo is involved? Because in Albania and other in, in Western Europe, uh, women, but even generally in the world, we are 50% of the population. Why should we uh, go for less? in, in, uh, in pol policy making, in parliament, in, in municipalities. So this is uh, what me personally, I have been stressing this fact that even the other, something else, that we don't want a place in parliament, in municipality, because we are women. No, it's not that, or because of the quotas. We need this place because, this, this position, because first of all, so the, there are many women who deserve it and who have been working all their life to achieve to this to this to this level so and so at the same time women should be equal opportunities to men this is what we are all asking for so to have equal opportunities if that happens then uh, then we will be, have a better world so men should come and realize that as long as women are not represented, are not, so are preventing from equal equalities, the, our society will not have the full potential. So, because we are, we are missing the, the possibilities, the, the qualities, the, 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 the qualities of half of, of percentage of half of the population. So this is, uh, this is uh, how I think that we should, we should work. And what we face here as one of the challenges that us as women face in Albania or in Western Western Balkans generally, it's the same. I think that uh, women face everywhere in the world uh, because uh, there is even on a world level there is a recognition that women uh, women are uh, marginalized from political and public life. Uh, this may happen because of structural factors or social economic institution in the, and even cultural barriers. So we have to work on all these fields in order to make women more participating, especially in the political life. 
Okay, thank you, Brunilda. Thanks for. Uh, I I have to. I think that I would pick up uh, one point of your talk first. Uh, the, is the point about uh, the number of women which who are not interested in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, so the political participation, that's a very interesting point that I would, would recall afterwards. But I would like to go back to Leah for a second round. And I would ask Leah, um, what, uh, even in the light of what Marina just said, what, uh, what is your perspective, what's the perspective you have? Uh, you, you, we, I would like to remember that to everybody that you, you have been working in international relations now for years, you're a specialist for foreign affairs, you are a member of the uh, Italian, uh, Italian um, uh, Parliamentary Committee on Foreign Affairs. Uh, so what's your perspective, uh, even in the light of what just moving the said on, on this, on the role of women for Western Balkans, even because Western Balkan, Albania, Western Balkan is not, uh, is a region where, I mean, we are all aware that uh, sometimes conflict is uh, uh, is uh, behind the corner to some extent. So, uh, please go ahead. Well, th there have been and there are par powerful uh, women in politics in the Western Balkans. Uh, Brunilda, which I met only virtually today, is one of those. Uh, but uh, probably the most famous is the former president, uh, former um, president of the parliament of uh, Kosovo. But there are ma many more, I mean, and I met uh, lots of them during uh, meetings that we do for interparliamentary unit and for other, uh, for the interparliamentary union and other meetings. Um, uh, three or two or three years ago, for example, the president of the the Speaker of the Parliament in Montenegro uh, promoted um, a meeting of young parliamentarians uh, of the Balkans. And there I met a few MPs from different Balkan countries that were really powerful and really um, pressed uh, the European members of Parliament that were invited to the meeting su supporting the idea of a European Union. and. For us, it was very interesting to hear from countries that are not yet member of the European Union, such a powerful defense of European institutions. And it is, this is an example. But again, um, I mean, the Western Balkans are going through a process of um, institu institution uh, consolidation, I'd say, rather than institution building and uh, through a very interesting process of um, uh, looking towards the European Union as a possibility for the future of, of, of those countries. Uh, in this respect, I think that uh, there is a huge role for young people, and I'm not, uh, I, well, I'm speaking to, to a group of young students, uh, there is a huge, huge role for those that uh, uh, in Albania, like in Italy, uh, in Kosovo, like in France, uh, and so uh, in Montenegro, like in Spain, see their future in Europe and not outside it. I mean, the force of young generation for driving these processes and for pushing for for a true European agenda of internal politics is enormous. And then there is a role for, for, for women, certainly. Uh, uh, reinforcing institutions, rebuilding institutions that were shattered by conflicts and by instability um, requires a lot of patience, a lot of um, uh, capacity to listen to problems and correct problems. Uh, of course, th these characteristics, patience, uh, ability to listen, uh, will to mend conflict, uh, are, uh, can belong to women and men. But I believe that women can play a huge part in this. At least in Italian politics, I don't know what it is like in Albania, we see 
a lot of ego from men, a lot of me, 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 and then the rest. Uh, and especially when you have a situation that you have to rebuild, that you have to create unity, that you have to find points that unite us rather than the, those things that divide us. This attitude of me, 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 my ego, and then the rest of the country is a problem. Uh, in Italy, and, and I'm not like I'm not speaking about something I don't know. In Italy, presently, we are in a very difficult experiment in order to fight against the pandemic that, as you know, uh, has hit our country very badly. You know it in Albania because your president, Edi Rama, did something extraordinary uh, last spring. He sent doctors from Albania to Italy in a moment when we really needed help. I'm sorry, but I'm, mo I'm still moved today by the gesture that we got from Albania. So we are, we, are, we are struggling against the pandemic and uh, our president of the Republic said at a certain point that we needed to overcome differences between political forces and unite. And we are in a, um, in a government of national unity which comprises 80% of the parliament, something that the country has not seen since the foundation of the Republic. In this moment in Italy, we are trying to find the things that unite us rather than those that divide us. And it's very complicated. And so in this moment, I believe that there is a lot of space for those of us as politicians that can put aside um, uh, um, those issues that uh, uh, maybe characterize some political forces, but that are divisive. And I have to say, honestly, Sometimes these politicians that can unite are women. The politicians that helped uh, countries overcome the virus outside of Italy are women. The performance of countries that are led by women is much better in some places than, uh, for example, in, in Western Europe, than countries that were led by men. And I, th I really think that it, it, this applies to Italy as much as it applies to Albania and to the Western Balkans, when there is a lot of work and, and there are difficult decisions to take, but you have to take them thinking about the good sides and the national interest of your country. Thank you, Leah. So since uh, uh, women are able to face difficult questions uh, different from men, that's usually men love uh, soft questions, but uh, I would like to pose a difficult question to Brunilla now, because there is a critical issue about Balkans and not only Albania, but even the whole Balkanian region, that we are aware that migration flows from Balkan region had started again in the latest two years. Now, is it, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned that, that it will be even worse in the future after the pandemic. And many of these migration flows are made of women, are made of smart girls going to coming to Italy to study or to work or, or going to Germany to work and what's that. So my question is, Bernita, my question for you is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure you are, you are concerned like uh, anyone else, but my point is, is there anything that could reverse this trend in, the, in a very short time? Mm -hmm. And uh, please, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, well, uh, you're playing hard, but you know, with women, you can do that. So we, we do not, <laughs> so we, we, we just go ahead and we, uh, we answer even there if there are difficult questions. Uh, well, um, as, as we were saying, so as we were talking about women and, and, and you said that uh, there is this, this, unfortunately, this tendency of migration from all the region, Albania and all the other countries. And uh, this is, it's a pity because uh, mainly we have young people leaving Albania and uh, a part of them, of course, if they are young people, uh, they are then uh, even even girls in uh, in that in that group, uh, girls or even women, if they have their husband abroad or if they want to uh, to live for. Usually, it's it's the uh, the idea is to go for a better life. Of course, the the uh, all the, the rational use behind is okay. I'm going to live because I need a better life. But uh, un unfortunately, there are cases when people are leaving, even people, well-paid people, 
who are who have a very good job and who are working in high institutions and get well paid really and uh the the problem here is of the future so uh to to stop this uh let's say migration flow of migration which is continuing and which is uh, affecting our our population because the problem is that this number of people leaving is affecting our population our our medium age is increasing from one year to the other because young people are leaving and uh, older people are remaining here and uh, what we should do and these are policies that the government should do every government that is in albania should do is to offer uh, uh, to offer a perspective. If you don't offer a perspective, I mean, if people are not uh, uh, convinced that within within one year, two or five years or four years or five years, they won't have a better life here in Albania, of course, they will tend to leave. They will leave the country. So the main, the main uh, issue and the main uh, problem is how can we uh, try to uh, offer or what should we do to offer to this to these people to the young people uh, a better a better perspective uh, for their country and this we have a lot of a lot of uh, let's say we have some some of the of the measures that are, can be economic ones like supporting the young people with uh, that want to have a startup for example supporting with policies supporting them with grants or with uh, with uh, easing them from taxes or all the, the economic measures that we can do to support the young people. So telling them that, okay, if you stay here in our country, you will have one, two, three, four, five uh, supports from the government. And uh, on the other side, uh, we should, uh, we should uh, improve our services. If we, don't, if we don't offer good services, even let's say that might be school education, that a lot of our young people go to to get educated abroad and they don't want to get back again that's 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 one of the problems so if we we need to offer better uh, school education and on the other side even better uh, facilities even uh, hospital facilities you know now with the covid 19 with the pandemic uh, we see that, that there there are problems so sometimes people tend to go abroad uh, because they, even though we have very good doctors here, they don't trust totally the the, the medical system, so the hospital, and say, okay, no, I'm, I'm, uh, it's better if I go abroad. So improving the services to, for for our for for our people is one of the ways uh, to keep them inside. So giving them a pros a perspective, a nice per perspective for their lives, because if they think that okay, the, the, the things will change because they change, of course, gradually. But if you think things are going to change within 10 years time or 20 years time, they won't stay here. They say, okay, I'll go and have a better life, a better possibility. So these are some of the ways that we can support them, support them so on the economic part, on, on the education part and health part. Okay, Brunilda, thanks a lot. Um... Uh, now we're going to have another quick round with our two guests. If someone after that wants to pose some quick question, you can do in chat. I would pick up for you. Otherwise, anyway, we have. Uh, I would like to start with. Uh, yes, we need to focus on education. I, I have to say, as a, a, a Catholic University, our lady of good council, we we play our game in this respect. You know. Um, anyway, I have a, I have a, the same question for both guests. Uh, you know, you both know that uh, politics and IR, international relations, um, are also shaped by expectation that uh, actors have about what's going to happen. And uh, we cannot ignore, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot deny that uh, now the world uh, appears to be free of the Trump nightmare, you know. We, we, we have been, uh, we have lived four years in a nightmare. It was called uh, Trump. And uh, why? Why nightmare? Because uh, you, you know that multilateralism, cooperation, the world was, uh, uh, was suddenly forgotten in the light of, uh, you know, muscular uh, uh, diplomacy and the potential use of force. So my question is, uh, in the, now in this, uh, in this world, in, this, uh, in the post-pandemic, uh, 
what will be the role of expectation, in particular with regard to the role of women at the top level. And now in the US, we have a vice, a vice president who is a woman, who is a top uh, educated and top, uh, uh, top uh, uh, very, very very important lawyer in California, now she is a vice president of the, uh, of the major power in the world, but uh, it's not happening the same in, in, other, in other countries. So my question for both guests is, uh, to what extent expectation about uh, uh, the role of women will also shape uh, expectation of girls and women in our area, in Southeast, uh, in, uh, in our region, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, Albania to Brunilda, but even for, uh, even for Italy, for, uh, for Leah. So Leah goes first, okay? Oh, sorry, I didn't get the, the, the question, I got lost. Oh, sorry. My question is, uh, since we rely upon expectation in both politics and international relations, and now we have uh, different expectations compared to a few months ago, because we don't have Trump anymore, right? But uh, basically, we are in a very different scenario, and the U.S. as a as a collaborative, uh, I don't care whether it's a Republican or Democrat, but as a collaborative president with a, uh, with a female vice president. So my question is that, but it's not the same in many other countries of the world, which are now moving towards perhaps autocracies, right? So my question is whether now uh, the, 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 the expectation about the role of women is going to change thanks to, the, to this shift we had just experienced in the US, but also in the other countries of the world. Well, I think that uh, the election of uh, Kamala Harris as vice president will give a powerful uh, push towards what Brunilda was saying. I mean, setting the example uh, in the most uh, important still country in the world and having a, women, a woman as vice president will help a lot. Um, and then, I mean, politics and international politics is done by leaders for the people. So if there is a change in leadership, this doesn't mean necessarily that, we'll, that you, you will have a change in policy in the same direction. So it doesn't mean, like uh, Margaret Thatcher, for example, when she was elected as a prime minister in, in the UK, she was the first uh, female prime minister of that country, but she didn't do any kind of uh, uh, female uh, uh, world politics or uh, politics for 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 uh, that was especially advantageous for for British women. So, but in the U.S. this time we have a female vice president that is a powerful example for many reasons. Um, and that is, uh, I think personally, somebody who thinks about uh, problems in a different way. So she, she will uh, set um, innovation in many different fields in internal and foreign policy. But also the Biden administration is an administration that has a completely different agenda than that of Trump. And the fact that they're acting very quickly, um, for example, to tackle the virus and do vaccination, uh, the fact that they are re-entering a lot of multilateral organizations, uh, the fact that, that uh, they are um, working a lot on um, different areas internally and internationally, uh, I think will set good policies for women, for example, for the, for the virus, for the pandemic, we know that the pandemic is uh, asking a bigger toll on women than on men, both in terms of work and in terms of domestic non-paid work. The fact that we have an administration in the US that is working very fast to achieve vaccination will benefit women. So it's not only a matter of having a woman vice president that sets the example, but it's also a matter to make policies that make 
the situation better for American women. At the same time, internationally, the fact that um, Biden has rejoined uh, the Paris Agreement on Climate, for example, uh, will help the world to achieve the, the, the goals on climate and will help women because women are more fragile economically and they're more exposed to, to, to uncertainties. And the fact that we work better to reduce one problem, which is climate, will help us uh, tremendously and will help women tremendously across the world. Thank you, Leah. So, Brunilda, yeah. what's okay. your point about that? Well, uh, I just mentioned it during, so when I, uh, when I made my presentation at the beginning, that uh, women so tend sometimes because of the, all the chores that they have to do at home, work, etc. Sometimes, uh, especially at a certain age when they have even children and they have all the, the, the housework to do and deal with the parents and the husband and whatever, so they tend to, to not to occupy, to, to, to deal with politics. And, uh, but, uh, well, there is a study, I was reading a study by Piper and Comer that showed that women uh, represented by a woman are more interested and become more involved in politics than the ones that are uh, represented, that those roles represented by a man. So, why this fact? Because they see that a woman, when she is in politics or in parliament, for example, usually it is, again, there are studies about this, that women tend to do policies which, are, uh, which benefit the whole society. So, uh, they tend to do policies and laws which support children, which support uh, elderly ages, which support families, rather than, so uh, more than men. And this is, this, these are so studies. So uh, I turn it back again, I turn it back to the point that if we have a role model like, like the vice president of the USA, it will of course serve to the, all the women of uh, all countries because, uh, okay, being the the, uh, uh, the most important kind of most powerful country in the world, it, it sets an example uh, even to the others. And uh, of course, it's the first time in their history that they have a, a, a vice president, a woman, a vice president. But uh, at this time of, the, uh, of, uh, of our history in 2021, I think that the time has come where women uh, should get represented more. And I think that a role, a very important role in this case is played by the youth. So youth are uh, a very important part of promoting uh, girls and women in politics and political life. Because as we know, uh, young people are, uh, tend to do the social changes. They tend to change uh, uh, the, uh, the history and to do better things. That's why if we involve them in this uh, gender equality issues, I'm sure that, that we will have a, a, better, a, better, and a, a better world uh, in the near future. And uh, of course, as Leah was saying, saying uh, pandemic COVID-19, uh, it is something, uh, it, it showed really a, a very, very difficult problems, even concerning the domestic violence. So there, he, there is a huge increase in some countries. It was a study of the UN women. The domestic violence was, uh, was up to even 25% more because during the pandemic, so the lockdown, uh, families were obliged, so they lived in more in, in, in closer uh, contact. So they were closed inside the homes. And so the domestic violence increased. And al also uh, the working places for the women, women and girls lost more working places rather than men. So, and these are all problems that we should resolve by uh, promoting women, by putting them on positions that can help other women. So, uh, you know, a woman knows better what, what another woman wants. Of course, I'm not saying that men don't know, don't know this, of, but 
uh, uh, it's it's much more easy that or it's easier that a woman know and helps another woman rather than a, a man uh, doing this thing. So that's why I'm always pro and I, I support the idea of, of the promotion of women, of having women in the in the in the up uh, upward positions and and uh, so. Uh, so duties, because you know we we have still the, the the glass ceiling that impedes women to go up. Because sometimes you have a whole women in one level, in maybe in the lower or middle level. But the more we go up, the less women we find. So that we have this glass ceiling which is impeding them. But uh, it's a process. I think that it is a process. Like Albania and the Western Western Balkans uh, are are doing this work of involving women in uh, in politics, having more and more women uh, in uh, in uh, government in parliament and in municipality councils we we uh, so we should work on this issue and uh, be, become better and better every day thank you brunil okay we are going to finish in uh, 10 minutes the last uh, quick two quick question to our guest uh, leah you know that in euro i mean even because we are we face difficult uh, difficult questions. So uh, the point is, we are aware that in, in Europe, in the European Union, there are many people who are skeptical about uh, Western Balkans as candidate countries uh, to EU. We know that Albania has been refused, uh, has been put veto on Albania last year, now Albania is a candidate country. So my question to Leah is, Leah, you think that uh, engaging women much more in uh, uh, international relation, Albanian international relation or Balkans in general approach to Europe may help Balkan countries to uh, overcome, to, to overcome uh, skepticism about uh, their assessment to you? Honestly? I think that uh, uh, <laughs> um, women participation is a good thing for the reasons that we discussed so far, but uh, the um, prejudice uh, and um, counter arguments on uh, opening up Balkan, Western Balkans and Albania participation to the European Union is a problem of European, of Western European, of certain Western European countries. It's not a problem of how Albania uh, faces up to Europe. So it's not Albania that should change the face with which they approach the European Union. Of course, Albania and other Western ba Balkans should uh, uh, follow. Uh, and should uh, implement uh, the different chapters of the um, of the European uh, integration process, of course. And there are areas where things can be done better, but I think there is a big block in Europe and we should fight that big block, which is very selfish and sometimes uh, uh, unmotivated. I mean, there is no reason why France's position against the accession process um, of certain Western Balkan countries is so strong. Um, and it is counterproductive. And this is the homework that we have to do within the European Union to convince all the European Union partners, uh, all the European member states, that there are more advantages in the accession pro process to go forward than uh, these advantages in uh, it stopping, uh, and this is a homework that we have to do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put a cross on the shoulder of Albanian, Albania, or other Western Balkan countries. The mistake is ours. I mean, you have, you have to do follow and to to work through through the accession process but we have to do a lot of homework as well thanks Celia. so brunil the last question for you uh, for you so yeah, about european integration as well um uh you think that uh, 
uh, in the light of all we say, the, in particular, what we say about even migration of uh, brain drain of uh, Western Balkan, this uh, uh, European integration of woods constitute access to EU, would access, uh, would constitute uh, uh, some added value for women in the Balkans in the end, or would be a way out for them? Uh, well, so you mean the, uh, joining the EU, it's going to be a value added to the women, uh, Albanian women or, your, or uh, Western Balkan women? This is the this is the question. If I'm not wrong, yes. Or the or the or the Albanian and Western Balkan women would consider joining the EU as a way to escape from Western Balkans. Uh, well. Um, I, I think that, uh, okay, join, joining the EU has been our, our dream for all our life. It's not, we are part of the EU, really. We are, we are in Europe. We are a European country. So uh, geographically speaking and even, even uh, psychologically speaking, we, we feel and we, we feel ourselves part of Europe. And uh, we share a lot of the European values as a country and even as the Western Balkans, all the area. And so uh, joining the EU uh, is one of the of our targets. So with all the uh, dues, with all the problems, with all the, the challenges that we have to face, of course, uh, because it's not it's not an easy road. Otherwise, we would have been members of the EU uh, just many years ago. So we have, of course, to do our homeworks as well. As, as, the, as Leah said, Europe has to do its own homeworks, but we have to do our homeworks as well. So like we have to fight to have continue fight our corruption. We have to uh, to continue and do the reforms that are, are requested, judiciary system, etc. But I think that uh, well, women uh, joining Europe uh, will uh, will will gain or will uh, will be part will give even a contribution. Let let's say even like on this on this uh, let's see it like on this way. So they it's it's a way. It's not only a way of one way thing. So you only take from from something. It's always uh, give and take. So of course we will gain. So even the women of Albania will gain being part of the Euro European Union. Uh, maybe some of the facilities that are offered to women there, some of the politics, better politics, etc. But on the other side, I think that they will give uh, 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 important uh, values uh, to the European, to this, to the European Union or to the countries. So sharing, sharing our values, like uh, as we as a country have, like hospitality, uh, the education, etc. So I considered it rather than seeing it as a way of escaping or nothing. I see it as a way of giving and taking the good things of, of our countries. Okay, thank you. So now, yeah, now it's one hour. So I think we we can uh, we can uh, we can finish now. Uh, so I would like to to thank personally and on behalf of Chespik and uh, our university, the Catholic University of Radio Council, both Lia Quartapelle from the uh, Italian Parliament and Brinda Pascali, Special Advisor of President Meta of the Republic of Albania. I only wanted to ask you if you want to uh, finish with 30 second personal thinking about it. Uh, I mean, without uh, any question of mine, but just uh, just up to you, 30 seconds. Leah. Well, I thank you very much. It's complicated to do a class with uh, students that you don't see and you don't know what they think. Uh, but I believe uh, from the questions that uh, we had from Raul uh, that uh, there is a lot of space to work across the Mediterranean. Again, I say it. Italy is completely um, touched by the gesture that Albania uh, gave when we were in most need last spring. And I hope uh, that, and uh, your president said it quite uh, rightly, it was a response to the solidarity that Albania received in the 90s from our, from our country. And I hope that this network of solidarity and dialogue uh, keeps going on. Thank you very much, Leah. Brunilda, your last 30 seconds. Well, uh, I would say that uh, I would just uh, uh, tell to the, to the young people that are listening to us, 
uh, to girls and boys that, and especially to the girls, that they should be united and support each other. If women support each other, then uh, of course, for sure, the world will be a better place. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think that tonight uh, we have been uh, a bit unconventional, but I think it's a way to work. So that's very good. So thanks for more time to Leah and Brunilda and see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you.